Welcome to Ahead of the Game, a podcast brought to you by the Digital Marketing Institute, giving you insights from industry experts to supercharge your marketing skills. Today is the Modern Mindset, where we explore those soft skills that are so vital to developing your career, and this episode is all about time management. I'm Will Francis, and today I'll be talking to Joe Williams, who runs Tribe SEO. He works for himself, from home, with a three-month-old baby, so I can't wait to hear how he keeps on top of the mountain of work he gets through with his impressive training business. Welcome to the podcast, Joe. Hi, Will. It's really good to be here, and uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, I mean, the, over the next hour, what I really want to get out of you is, you know, you're clearly a very busy guy, you've got a lot to do, and somehow you get it all done, and, I, and I'd just love to hear more about how you do that. Um, so just give me a brief overview of what is your kind of current personal time management setup or framework? Um, yeah, so I, one thing, um, obviously being a dad, recent dad, um, you know, it's wonderful, um, you know, to have, to become a father, but at the same time, it's, you know, you do have to be, um, a little bit more controlled of your time. Um, so I'm quite lucky in that, although I work from home, I work from uh, in a cabin outside of my home. Um, so it's a little bit detached. You know, I don't hear any of the noises <laughs> coming from the house. Um, but yeah, in terms of my basic productivity setup, um, I follow a system that's quite close to the book called Deep Work. And the idea with Deep Work is that you kind of, you, you, you set aside periods of time. So it could be, uh, it, it follows a time block system. So it might be free sets of 90 minutes and they're intensively intensive focused amounts of work and it's really important if you can to turn off distractions so that would be putting your phone in airport mode it would be turning off notifications on your computer Um, and for me that's all done in the morning that's when my mind is most clear and that's kind of when I really focus the the best and just Um, explain to me what deep work so yeah so deep work um it comes from the book called deep work um by cal newport i believe is the author and he he sort of talks about the difference between deep work and shallow work now deep work is your kind of like really important tasks that you need to do um now hopefully they should be aligned with tasks that you really want to do and you're really interested in Um, and in order to do them effectively you need to have what what cal calls deep work So that's long periods of time which are uninterrupted. Um, And, you know, the reality is without being disciplined, that's not what we normally do. We normally have notifications on our on email that pop up on on the computer, social media notifications pop up and we're just constantly being interrupted, you know, whether it's digitally or maybe the person next to you if you work in an office. And it's just if you can, you know, maybe you can't do three sessions in a morning Maybe you can do one session where you come to work a little bit earlier and that could be your deep work session. But it's it's trying to be mindful of how you can focus your energy and time. You've talked about this idea of, um, it's, it's, uh, I can't remember who popularised it, but of eating the frog. So when you do that deep work, it's really facing the big nasty thing that you've got to do today you probably would procrastinate and put off and just muck about on social media and say i'll do that this afternoon but you just go straight into that yeah so like eat that frog that's that's another another, another book it sounds quite a strange uh, phrase but it's it's really um about thinking about what's your most uh, daunting but possibly your most important task that you need to do um and doing that early on in your day and the way that i kind of frame my day um, is that I, can't, I have a morning routine and uh, an, an afternoon routine. And the mor- morning routine is right at the start of my work day and the afternoon is right at the end. And you, you, can, call, you can call that bookends of your day, essentially. So the, it kind of starts the day before. So for, for, the af- for the afternoon routine or sort of early evening routine, it's about reviewing your day, you know, how well you feel you've done in terms of what you set out to do. Um, it's about, this is something that I find really important. It's about setting a focus for the next day. So, you know, we probably have, you know, at any one time, we've probably got dozens and dozens of things that need to be done. And if we're not very clear on what we're going to do the next day, you know, it, it can get a little bit overwhelming. Like when you finish your day of work and you know, you've got so much more to do, 
you know, you, you, you kind of don't go skipping into work the next day if, if it seems like it's going to be quite hard to get everything done. So you wake up every morning knowing what you're going to do. You've already decided the night before. In general, I, ideally, yeah. <laughs> like I, when I'm when I'm really like on, on track and in flow, that's exactly how I work. And you know, th- these days, more often than not, that's that's exactly how how I do things. So it will it will essentially be trying to simplify what are the most important things I should be doing into the three top tasks of the day. Um, and what what that kind of means is when you kind of close the day and working from home, I always try to finish at five p.m shut down my computer and, you know, and switch off. But as much as you, you know, I feel like I am, I am switched off that I can spend time with my family and enjoy it. You know, whether you're going to sleep, um, and you'll have those three tasks, you know, you'll be thinking about them at some level mm. and you'll be surprised, you know, how often people say that, you know, they had a, there was a, a problem and overnight they woke up the next morning and they had a solution. They slept and, on it. Yeah, I think it was like Paul McCartney. Um, I'm not sure if it was yesterday, the it song was, Be- yeah. Beatles. And yeah. he, he said that he just woke up with the full music in his head and he wasn't sure whether he it was actually someone else's song. So there's there's something quite powerful, I think, from a, you know, whether it's a subconscious or whether it's a dream state, um, actually giving your body time to think about something. And also, like, you know, we even for those that really, really love their work, I think sometimes if, if it's not clear what you need to do when you get up, it can sometimes think, oh, God, I'm just going to open my email and, and just jump into the Start day. Start firefighting. Start firefighting. And and that's kind of so that's kind of some things that I would be thinking about in a afternoon routine. But in a morning routine, it's, um, you know, bef- definitely not opening up emails to so start with. You don't with. check email all morning. Generally not. If I can, if I can oh, help it. Hard. And but in particular, I don't check. I, de- I don't check email right at the start um, because I think that can really it starts pulling you, you know, you're getting a little bit sidetracked. A kind of productivity guy that I follow, he probably wouldn't say he's a productivity guy, but Hal Elroyd, he's written a book called The Miracle Morning. And in oh, the... I'd, mi- like, I'd like one of those. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds pretty good, sounds doesn't great. it? But, you know, he, he sold, you know, it's, it's, I think it's multi-million um, books sold. It, he's pretty, you know, kind of established. And, and that Miracle Morning comes down to these six, what he calls life savers. And the savers basically stand for um, six things that he recommends you do in the morning. And he, he says you can either do this over an, maybe an hour, or you, he even says it's possible to do over in six minutes, which I think is a little bit of a stretch. Um, but if you, if you maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe around half an hour. So I'm, I'm going to see if I can remember, <laughs> remember what <laughs> these are now. We've got... Um, so first of all, we have... Silence silence which is s um so that's that's kind of like meditation um it's having a moment you know whether i've got an apple watch on my on my uh hand and what that what what i can do with that watch is there's a breathe app so i I basically just take five minutes out and i just have some quiet i haven't even put my 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 monitors on and in fact i've got a um a kind of self I've got quite an advanced um, green t- or a, a tea maker, which basically allows you to set the brew time, the temperature, um, and it's loose leaf. Um, so it's it's a re- it's a nice um, you know kettle, um, but it takes roughly five minutes to to kind of heat up and to brew the tea. So I basically do my. Um, so you start the day with what sounds like the Japanese tea ceremony. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I love green tea, so I. Um, I, I generally go for green tea with brown rice, um, which has got a name in Japanese that I can't remember. But if you Google green tea with brown rice, it gives it a slightly sweeter taste, um, not as bitter, and it's got a slightly popcorn taste to it. And it's you know it's meant to be quite good for you. Um, so that's kind of like my silence, which is the first thing that I'll do. Um, the next two are kind of like, I, I wouldn't say I always do. So that the second one is affirmations. Um, which I have tried, but I wouldn't say do it regularly. So that's where you have a positive thought. It's often quite good to do when you're exercising and you kind of repeat it in your mind. Um, so it's it's trying to get a positive mindset to start that day with, with sort of good in- intentions. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's A of savers. The third one is visualization. Um, now that one I think is a good one. And that I combine that with the next one, which is E for exercise. 
Now, this is going to, when I mention the exercise that I do, you, 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 you know, you may laugh a little bit, but I basically have a rebounder in my cabin. And a, re a rebounder is like a mini trampoline. And I've kind of gone for the one that doesn't have springs. So it's quite silent, but it's also quite um, fluid in terms of how you bounce on it. Cool. And I'll sometimes mix it up with some like mini weights that I'm uh, bouncing around. And the idea is, I think NASA said that it's kind of one of the most efficient forms of exercise that you can do because it's very low impact on your um, on your body but also it's actually quite good for your um, just your general well-being um, your in terms of how we we, we, we pump um, blood around the body it's you know it's from our heart but in terms of how we pump um, get rid of toxins from the blood and from our body that's our lymphatic system and that needs motion to be effective mm. so a good way of doing that is 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 you know is walking is running or you know in rebounding. my case re <laughs> rebounding that sounds great i mean so that's quite a high energy start to the morning you're really kind of getting the blood flowing getting the brain you know enriched and fed with uh, yeah, yeah and you know that might be like 10 or 15 minutes doesn't have to be anything you know a huge amount of time but that's where I would sometimes combine it with a visualization. So now that I know what the free tasks are that I really want to get done that day, it's just visualizing one, how am I going to do that and how I'll feel afterwards that I know that that's been done. And I might combine that with the free tasks that I want to do for, for the week as well. Um, and so you actually think about not only doing it, but how you're going to feel when you've done it. That you're going to imagine yourself having done it and how I good that I think feel. that's the key thing with visualization and, and you can do it at a kind of micro level which is like the day you could do it at a macro level which might be for the year what your year goals um and it's it's kind of like you know I, I am a little bit of a like to read self-help books and that sort of thing and I think the, the key thing the key thing that I've kind of learned is in fact L Hel Helroyd's new book it's something, uh, not the success equation, but it's something similar. And there's two points to it. And the first point is really completely believing that you can do what it is. And then the second point is basically doing the work. Um, so the visualization is helping you believe that you can actually do what you intend to do. And when, and if you genuinely believe that, it's like athletes, you know, they, oh, yeah. they actually, you know, top athletes um, have been through the process of actually winning that race hundreds and hundreds of times in their minds. And I think it, I think it came from the Olympics, from the Russians actually came with this visualization technique in sports. Um, and look, I'm not saying that every day I'm, you know, by detail visualizing every task that I do, but I find more often than not, when I do focus more on visualization for the day, I tend to, I tend to have a better day and feel more satisfied at the end of it. Yeah, I think I, can, I understand that because it's not about just, um, I suppose, a list in a positive state within yourself. But I think it organizes your thoughts well and sets, kind of organizes your brain around those three tasks and really puts you into your first burst of deep work, well prepared. But also, I think, you know, it, it, the, what, the, one of the most common problems I come across with clients and, and uh, delegates on courses that want to get into marketing um, is confidence. It's, I, I think it's by far the biggest issue and everyone goes into it with imposter syndrome, you know, where they don't feel like, you know, they feel like they're the one that's going to get caught out for not knowing everything and um, they're not worthy of their place sat as, you know, in the marketing executive seat and um, I think confidence or lack thereof is, and maybe it's cultural, maybe it's a British thing, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's global um, and I think it's the biggest thing holding people back. So I think all those uh, so to some people, they might sound a bit a bit odd, but actually, uh, d visualizing yourself, you know, succeeding in those roles and in the, with those tasks is really important, I think, because then you can believe it, you know, and um, it becomes prob it becomes possible at the very least. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, and and in fact, when I was walking um, walking t to here today, um, it was just something came up on my phone and. The, I forget the lady's name. It's Marie something. She's very, um, she's very sort of big in her space in America, but she's got a new book and it's called Everything Is Figure Outable. Um, it's a bit of a sort of uh, strange phrase, but the idea is that you know, like you might doubt what you can do, particularly for bigger projects. You might doubt whether you can actually do it at all. But if you go in with a mindset that everything actually is 
figure outable you can figure things out then then you start to believe that that it's true that it that it can happen mm. and until you get until you actually get to that stage where you believe something is possible um in fact i think with l helrod's second book it's like first you've got to believe that it's possible then you've got to believe that it's um um i think it's like likely and he uses a different word mm. and then after that it's inevitable and it's you can't jump you can't jump from possible to inevitable it's it's sort of it's 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 building up that confidence as you say that you that 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 you that you're that you're in that good space mm -hmm. and and just to quickly kind of wrap up the savers um you've got reading so i don't always do this in the morning but it may be that i am reading a book or listening to an audio book so maybe there's like 15 minutes or 20 minutes there um again I'm, if i'm rebounding sometimes i will listen to some some audio so it could be an audio book and then the last one is um scribing um which is basically writing and I think, you know, a lot of people would be actually journaling. So it might be just getting any kind of thoughts in their mind, good or bad, just writing them down, um, maybe writing down their experience from the previous day. Could be any could be a problem that you've got on your mind that you, you know, everything is figure outable. I've got a problem. I'm just going to scribble. I'm not going to think too much about what it is and see what comes out. Um, but of those six, it's it's more the silence, the visualization, and the exercising. So I tend to focus more on those three. Yeah. But now and again, I'll, I'll throw in another one of, of that list and, and, and see how I get on. So that's your morning. You start with those, you um, and then you go into three 90-minute periods of deep work. Yeah, I find that's probably the one biggest change for me is 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 finding the time to do it, switching off notifications, and I slightly gamify it by using an app um, called Forest. So this is, I use it on my iPhone. I'm pretty sure it's on Android. And the idea is that for X number of minutes, you grow um, a tree in a forest. Um, so you, and also it encourages, it encourages me anyway, when I, when I see it in front of me and I can see the minutes counting down, um, I find it's much easier to stay focused for those 90 minutes and say to myself, I can't jump out now. I'm doing a deep work session. And rather than list, I find the problem of listening to music is that it's a, it's a little, you can have a little cheat where you just change the track um, or you find a new artist. It's breaking up that deep work. So in this app, I it starts off with, I think it's some music, um, some sounds from the forest. And it's slightly gamified. After you've got a certain amount of points, you can change the sound. Um, so I'm now listening to like a cafe in Paris. So it's it's people <laughs> people sort of talking French, which you know I don't really speak French, so I don't understand what's being said. It's not and it, distracting. It's not distracting, and 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 but I I find using that app like I like my statistics, and what you can do is you can look back on a daily basis how many minutes you did of deep work, um, weekly basis, monthly basis, and I find that quite quite motivating. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's something that's working quite well for me. That's great. I mean, yeah, I was going to ask you what you listen to, but, um, you've sort of answered it because what I think's really, I've come across so many people now that use these websites and actually you can get it on Spotify now because of the popularity that just play ambient sounds. So the sound of a coffee shop is a really popular one. Yeah. And it's there's something that's very slightly, almost a bit black mirror about that, you know, that who would have thought 10 years ago that we'd all be sitting where everyone's gone freelance and we're just sitting in our silent homes listening to the sound of a coffee shop. Yeah, uh, no, we work. it's, it's crazy. Weird. And I think, you know, it's probably like a loop every two or three minutes. Cause yeah, you, that's you right. You hear yeah. like these <laughs> chings of glasses every now and again. But I think the key thing there really is that you are, you're not thinking about what the next track is or if a track comes on, and you don't we've heard it too many times or whatever and you know i like listening to classical music and i think for when i'm working and i find that i'm less likely to get distracted and think i need to change the track or find a new artist um so so yeah I, you know and don't, don't get me wrong i'm not doing that all day um as i'm sure we'll come on to in, in a moment the the idea with deep work is that's for important tasks and it it does actually take a bit you know it does use up quite a lot of energy mental energy in the day and in the afternoon i focus more on shallow tasks so these are things that are less important require less mental energy um and are more maybe more ad 
admin based and they, they sometimes they're things that I, I i'm putting off or i don't really want to do so they're not essential they're there to do in the afternoon but also working from home that's more the time that you know like if there's an emergency my my wife will will come knocking on the door you know in the morning or she needs help then she'll do that as well but it's more in the afternoon that you're I, disturbable i'm much more disturbable yeah and and i and i feel like quite often i'll i'll, I'll I'll have done my top three most important tasks by You've by already lunchtime. won by lunchtime. Yeah, basically. it's like, yeah. This, I think there's the phrase, win the day, you know. Yeah. If you win the day, you've won the month sort of thing. And you feel good about yourself. And I think what happens is when you get easily distracted, which I think we all do in this digital, you know, age, then, you know, what I sometimes used to find is come five o'clock, I'd feel a bit frustrated that I hadn't got done what I planned to get done. And that can have a knock-on effect into your evening. You know, you're... You're not quite as chirpy with your spouse as perhaps you normally would be. And, you know, I don't think it should be that way, really. Um, you're, you kind of control what you do, or to a certain level you do, depending on what your job is. But you do, you know, you do have a sense of control. And I think it's important to try and fit in a, a system that, that, you, that you trust. That's a key thing, that you, you trust that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. That's really interesting to hear how you structure your day. Um so uh, at lunchtime, I, I, you, um, I already read that you uh, you go for a, you take a long lunch, an hour and a half. You go for a walk, perhaps even a swim, uh, with the dog. Um, take a you know have a have a good lunch, have a shower, because obviously you work from home, so uh, we we get the you know luxury of working in our pajamas, doing deep work. Um, and it's I, I don't know about you, but I always find. Um, Often when I'm in the shower, I'll have real clarity of thought and, and I'll come up with really good ideas or, or, or some of my best thinkings in the shower. And then I'm often my next thought will be, um, God, yeah, annoyingly, e- Elon Musk is right about that because he talks about that. That's like when he's asked about what his top productivity hack is, he's like, have a shower yeah. because because what because actually showering yourself is such a routine. You don't have to think about it, but you are stuck in it. So you're forced. So for some reason, that's a very fertile environment for your mind to sort of wander off. So it's actually quite nice to do it at lunchtime because you can reflect on the morning a little bit and then have some ideas about things you might want to do that are less challenging in the afternoon. Yeah, and I I totally agree in that I, I some of my best ideas come from in the shower. And I think there is some physical um, science behind it with like the... The water hitting the top of your head yeah, and there's yeah. like you know I I, I I was listening to a podcast and I forget the technicalities but I I do get really good ideas in the shower and what I tend to do is I have my Apple watch with me and I'll set a reminder to say what the idea is so I you know I remember it oh my god um, so you take notes in the shower yeah I'll, I'll, go, I'll go um Siri reminder and say what it is and yeah and, and then if it's you know it's a particularly good idea um but yeah, I think some of my, I think generally your good ideas come from when you're out of context. When you're not at your desk. So yeah, it could be going for a walk, but I think a more concentrated time, if I'm having a shower for five or 10 minutes, I'm much more likely to get a really good idea then than say, you know, half an hour walk. Although, you know, both are good opportunities, but um, yeah, I think it, it, showers are good. They are. They, I think keep, can, they keep you clean and they, they give you new ideas. It does help to be clean. So Okay, so that what that takes me into is thinking about you know logging ideas. Tell me about your setup with because it's something I'm slightly obsessed with. Is your to do list, your notes? How do you capture ideas? Where is the digital kind of repository for you of all these things? And and how do you organise your thoughts, your to dos, your tasks, etc.? Yeah, well, I. I think in another kind of, you know, an, another workspace, I think I would get into productivity from an app, app perspective and not quite sure in, in what way, but I've got a genuine interest and I've tried a lot of different apps, to-do apps, you know, things like Evernote to store your filing system. And you can waste quite a bit of time trying all these different tools out, but it, it is something that I enjoy doing. Um but I've kind of moved from, I think one of my big takeaways um, with this is I think your to-do and your filing system needs to be separate. It could be the same app, but it needs to be separate. Your to-do has to be just actionable things. 
Um, and I have tried, you know, I've tried to do my to do within Evernote. I've tried to store lots of Evernote stuff into a to do um, app and I, I've had mixed success. But the, the app that I use now that I'm very happy with is called Notion. Um, so the website is notion.so and it's it's a strange app like it, it it would probably describe itself as a relational database which doesn't really sound that doesn't sound that interesting or, or useful for most people but what that means is a relational database is kind of like a, a traditional database where you can store files you can store items a bit like excel like how excel works is it a bit like airtable it's it's very it's like airtable so it, basically airtable is like it, it, it's 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 it, Airtable is one of its competitors, mm. but where it positions itself differently is Airtable is kind of more truer to a spreadsheet in terms of how it use it, how you use it. But it's much more flexible in a spreadsheet as a to do item, mm. but it combines elements of Evernote. So you can web clip files into your storage system and it also combines. I mean, I think you can do this in Airtable, but it also combines elements from Trello. So if you like to have a can Kanban system where you move things from being to do, to doing, mm, to done, left to right, yeah. from left to right. That's kind of how my brain works on a kind of, <coughs> on, a, on, a, on a doing way. Like I really like that Kanban system. Mm. But the other real nice benefit of, of Notion is it's aimed at um, content creators. So it's, it's much nicer, I think, to use compared to Airtable when you're writing um, pieces of content. It's got, it just feels nice how, how you use it. And they haven't gone for like loads of super duper features. They've kind of gone for simplicity and how it all unifies and, you know, and, and and how you use it. So I, yeah, I use it for my day to day to do uh, to do list. I use it for when I'm creating an online course. Um, I will have, um, you know, I, I, I'll have the high level outline of what my what the modules are, then what the lessons are within the modules. Um, and then within that, you can click on an item within a row and you've got a really, it's almost like Word, but nicer than Word to write in. Yeah. And you can have expandable um, parts of content so you can kind of open and close them. So it's nice to kind of like play around with, you know, getting ideas for content. And it's all, it also, it's quite flexible and adaptable. So you can show how much progress you've made for a, for a particular project. So if I have set up, if I've got nine modules and I've got maybe seven lessons per module, it's quite a lot of lessons to complete, but it's quite reassuring to see what percentage of those lessons I've done. And you can, and if with a little bit of tinkering, you can you can set that up. I must try that. That sounds great. Yeah, it's not that. I think they've got a free version and the, the, the premium version isn't that expensive either. Um, I, yeah, I think it's just, it's easy to use um, and it's it's it, it, it's nice and simple, yeah. Because I personally, I've tried, I feel like I've tried lots of different systems. And I think I got, I, I arrived at the conclusion uh, maybe two or three years ago that the perfect system is just a myth. And the perfect system is like asking what the perfect pair of shoes is. You know, it's just different for everyone. And, it, and it's, it's so, you know, if you look on a site like Medium, the, the kind of, you know, big blogging site, um, so much content is devoted to productivity hacks tips lists tools and it's so there's such an allure to anybody who's trying to get a lot of stuff done it's so um I'm, we're just like moths to the flame anything to do with productivity we're like oh my god this is the hack yeah. this is the one that's gonna revolutionize the way i work and i'm gonna suddenly become this you know super productive person and i suppose the two things having tried all these systems i think the two things that came out of it for me was a there's no perfect system but also i do worry that today we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to always be productive and even though you know much as I love podcasts and audio books uh, I'm guilty of thinking right I've got to do some washing up now or I've got to wash the car and must listen to some valuable knowledge-based content because I've got to be productive during this time and maximize my time uh, you know are we forgetting to just waste time a bit and switch off and relax yeah I I think we are. And I, I think it's important that you can switch off and relax. You know, like when I walk my dog, I, you know, I will quite often be listening to a podcast. Sometimes I'm not. And the thing that I like about swimming with my dog when it's warm enough to in, in the sea 
um, is that, you know, there are no distractions. I'm not listening to anything. Yeah, your Bluetooth headphones don't work quite so well. No, I haven't got waterproof ones and I, <laughs> I don't plan to, to buy waterproof Bluetooth headphones. Um, but, you know, I'm in na- you're in nature. You've got your dog, you know, man's best friend next to you. Um, and you're swimming away. You know, maybe I'm checking the ball for her or um, just, you know, just playing around and relaxing. And I think... You know, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, is life about being productive or is life about, you know, it, you know, enjoying yourself? And I think that I think that there's overlaps with both. But I think if you want to be pro- productive, you need the space to relax and to to and just to have some thinking time. And, you know, much like you need sleep to recharge physically, sleep helps you recharge mentally. But I think you need moments in the day as well. That space, you know, it's like. If you look at a web a website, it's that white space or that em- sure. that empty space that really puts it together. Like with music, it's the space that makes the music. And you know, if you're just a busy bee all day long and you're optimizing your time by listening to podcasts and, and things like that, which are, which are great, you know, I, I do that myself. But I think you need those moments as well where you can kind of um, just take a breather and just know you have that space in your day. Yeah, I mean, it's just something you said about, you know, uh, switching your computer off at the end of the day. Um, and a few weeks ago, my um, my son spilled a glass of water on my laptop and that was it. That was the end of my MacBook Air. And so I had to dig out my wife's old iMac and you have to, it's a, you know, it's a, you have to plug it in. It's not a laptop and I have to go and sit at my desk and switch it on and off. And that's really had a really positive impact on the way I work strangely because I go and sit at the desk I do work and then I walk away from the desk and if I've had a good day you walk away with the feeling like you've earned the right to just do absolutely nothing in the evening and just completely relax and you're off the hook you don't feel that slight guilt that you could have done more and maybe you should maybe just answer a few emails to kind of get back out of the red as it were um so yeah I think that's I think that's a really probably one of the most valuable things we can do well, yeah, in, in the book, um, Deep Work, that's where I got the idea from Cal Newport. At the end of the day, not, he switches his computer off, but he actually says to himself, shut down complete. And in saying in saying that, it's kind of re-emphasizing that he has done his work and he's, you know, and we're not, we, none of us are perfect. We'll sometimes check our phones for emails and things. But by physically turning off the computer, as you say, it gives you that sense of, you know, the books closed. The books, you've, you know, there's, you've drawn a line in the sand and you're now stepping into your next part of your day, which is, you know, having more space and time to do other things. And thinking about that kind of tension between, you know, your own time and your productive time, how, uh, how did having um, a, a baby change your priorities? I think it, it you know, it, it obviously changed your priorities in a, in a lot of ways, but I think it, 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 it it helped from a time management perspective because, you know, I had read Deep Work a while before and I had tried, played with the ideas and I liked how it all, you know, made sense from a kind of information perspective. But I didn't really do it that much. But in the last couple of months, I'm kind of like, you know, it's hard to get done what I need to get done. The pressure's on, isn't it? Yeah, the pressure is on. Like, I haven't got as much flexy time if if I haven't got something done to complete what I had planned to get done. And it can get frustrating and that, and you don't want those frustrations to be passed on to the time that you do have after work. So I think it's kind of having a baby, like it's, you know, it's it's like one of the greatest things, amazing things, you know, you can have, but at the same time, same time it, it like changes everything. And in, in some ways you have to change yourself. And I think from a productive perspective, you wanna you, you don't want to be productive outside of work necessarily. You want to just be free and open, but that kind of means that at some stages during your work, you kind of need to, to to do things. And for me, I've always known that I work better in the morning, and that and I and I have to a degree done always done my most important work in the morning and and given myself a bit of slack in the afternoon. But what I hadn't done is is sort of time blocked these sessions in a way where you know my my wife knows that if she really needs me she has to use skype um in the morning because i'll I'll have skype on on my because i generally don't use skype so not no one's really coming in that way to, to contact me but i've turned the notifications off my phone 
um, and you know email notifications. So that's that's a way that she can kind of come in, but she knows herself. Then it like it, 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 there has to be sort of like a reason, I guess. Yeah. So it's brought this discipline really that it's put that pressure on to bring real structure and discipline to what you do, it so has. that you can you know part the waves and make that kind of time for yeah family. and. I was listening to a podcast recently and they were taught and it really um, struck a chord with me. And the guy being interviewed was saying, you know, like, you know, as a general rule, most people feel that that integrity is an important thing. Like it's a value that they have in a personal level and probably from a workplace perspective. But when we think about self integrity, that's basically doing what you what you say you're going to do or, or doing what you feel you should do. And quite often when we miss a deadline or we don't do something and this repeats and repeats and repeats, then there comes a point where you don't always believe that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. And when you get to that stage, it's quite hard. And, you know, I kind of felt with the pressure of having, you know, after having a new baby with less time or spare time anyway, I kind of felt like I needed to kind of get better at that self-integrity where I was meeting deadlines more often than I wasn't. And these these are my own deadlines now, and I feel these, these this time blocking approach has really helped. Mm, that's that's really interesting. That yeah, it is definitely a massive life change, and does I think does push you to be a better person. So you know, it's a good thing to do. Um, okay, so I mean, we talked lots, obviously, you know, about this through the lens of someone who is freelance, who works at home, but of course, um, it's just as challenging in lots of different ways working in a busy office with lots of other people around you um you know what what sort of productivity i suppose uh, techniques or hacks have you tried whether it's been successful or not you know in 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 in-house or agency or office environments i think you know even just coming back to having those top three tasks for the day you know whether you're going to get distracted or not it's nice to know what the what the finishing line is at the end of the day. Like if you know what the three things are you need to get done, that is the finishing line. And if and if you get two of them done, you can feel quite good about your day. If you get three of them done, you feel you know really good about your day. So it's being clear what what is important for your day and to try and aim to get those done. And also when you do have interruptions, it's easy to say, yes, I can do that. But and sometimes if it's your boss, you know, there, there may not be much wriggle room. But you, you know, but if you do know what your free tasks are, you can say to your boss, yes, I can do that today, but the three things I'm working on are these three things. And they're important because they're contributing to this bigger project. That thing that you want me to do will probably take me about an hour and a half, which means I definitely won't be able to do all of these three things. Um, I mean, that might sound a little bit like... No, I think that's true. I think if you haven't agreed, if you haven't even agreed with yourself what you need to do that day... How are you then going to be able to work out whether you can go to a meeting or yeah. do something else that pro- crops up unexpectedly? Exactly. And it might be that it's not that you're saying that you can't do it. It's that what you had planned today was this. And you, you might say, you know, it's, it's Tuesday now. Thursday, I've got, you know, I've got a lot more space in terms of what I'm planning to do. You know, I'll have that hour and a half um, that can definitely get that done then. If you re- if it really needs to be done today, then I can, you know, th- there's flexibility in what I what I what 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 I can do, but it will it will it will have an impact. And I remember when I actually worked in an agency, there was this. Um, we did a lot of Excel, um, um, particularly when I was doing Google Ads. Mm. And there was this one guy that was like like an admin assistant, but he was like exceptionally good at Microsoft Excel. So if you had a big project and you were struggling with time, um, he was your go-to man. But what he was really good at doing is he had time blocked his day based on tasks that people had asked him to do. And I would say to him, hey, can you do me? Can you do this for me? And, it, and he would work. He'd be like, yeah, it's about an hour's worth of work. And he'd be like, no, I can't do it today. And like and you could see in his calendar, like this guy wasn't they, they, he wasn't they, there was no wriggle room. He genuinely couldn't do it that day. And because he had planned out his day to, to quite a high level of precision you you trusted what he said you're like well can you do it tomorrow and he's like yeah i can do it tomorrow like between 10 and 11 that's that's how detailed he was and i'd be like i'd be like that works for me you know and it's and it's kind of like you know i'm not saying that you, you you would have to take it to that kind of a level but when you do start to plan out your day you're in a stronger position to kind of you know negotiate with with potential interruptions yeah absolutely um 
And I mean, everyone hates meetings and there are some sort of modern companies who insist on like, you know, standing only meetings and all that kind of thing. Um, have you got any thoughts on how to make meetings effective? How do you make meetings effective? Um, I mean, I don't have that many, many meetings. Not but these days, but no, I'm no, sure, of course. But, but no, but I, I've been in a lot of meetings and I remember being in a meeting with um, with Stellius from, you know, EasyJet and Easy Cruise. So big, big personality. And, you know, he would he would start the meeting by saying, you know, what is the purpose of this, of this meeting? What do we want to get out of this meeting? It was very clear. Why are we if, here, if, yeah. if you'd been in one meeting, you knew the second time you had that meeting, you you were going to get asked that and you needed to have a good answer for it. He wanted it to be concise. And at the end of the meeting, he would say, OK, he'd recap on what the reason was. And he'd remembered all this. He was you know, a sharp guy. And then he'd say, what are the next actions? Joe, you know, because we I was working agency side, helping him with the SEO, it's like, Joe, what's, you know, what are your next actions? And he, he would ask the table <laughs> and it was like, you knew that he was on the ball and there needed to be a purpose behind the meeting and it needs to be concise. And a lot of accountability, you know, for everyone, you know. Yeah, it's like, well, okay, you know, I've, you've said you're going to do this. So, you know, these are, and, and I, I think there was someone next to him taking the meeting notes. So you knew that this has all been noted as well. But yeah, I, I just think when it comes to a meeting, like it, it needs to have a clear purpose. And I think um, I think ideally it needs to have a time frame as well. If you if you set a meeting at 10 and generally speaking, you might have booked out 10 to 11 in the calendar. But if it only needs to be 20 minutes, I think it's, it's to try and be clear that that it, this is this is we're going to talk about this in this meeting. It's going to be you know fairly short, maybe 20 minutes. Um, and, you know, let's let's work out what the the reason is behind the meeting mm-hmm. and let's come up with a solution of what we that, that, that everyone's on the page um i think the other were the other sort of thing with meetings is do they need to happen you know or do they need to happen as regularly as they as they have have happen and i have someone um who helps me um from an seo perspective so if i do some client work um yolanda does you know she helps me with some some of the work and you know at stages we need to have um weekly meetings but right now because of the way things are working it, it doesn't need to be that regular maybe it's every couple of weeks and we've recently changed it from being every week to being slightly less regular so I think you've got to kind of ask yourself the question is what's the purpose behind the meeting does it need to be this regular does it need to be this long I think we've all been in um, weekly status meetings that feel like they're a broken record and exactly the same as last week's and yeah and you know know. and if you've got like 20 people in a a status meeting you know maybe maybe it makes sense to just get you know not everyone needs to be in that meeting at a certain time um and maybe there's a summary that's sent out after could have been an email summary yeah i come out i've come out of too many meetings and thought that could have been an email it's thinking about email and communication how how do you prefer to communicate with people and how do you use communication tools to improve productivity well i mean you know email is email and it's 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 useful and you need to do it so you're not anti-email you know i'm I'm not anti-email but when i actually work with a number of freelancers so i have someone that does my website design i have someone that helps with my copywriting and and proofreading i have someone that helps me with powerpoint design and design for courses um you know maybe another freelancer I do. I generally do all that through Trello because I find it's quite good for collaborative. But I would say ninety percent of my communication, or maybe seventy-five percent of my communication, is through um, screencasts. So I will. I'll define a, a, a task, or in Trello you call it a card. I'll, there'll be an outline of. Sometimes it literally says at the person. Here's my explainer, and here's my slides. And that's going to my PowerPoint person. And then it's just a link, a Dropbox link. I use a tool called Snagit. And then it's me looking at the the slides that we're currently working on and just giving feedback on where we're at or what I need. And it's just like a five minute video. And, you know, that I find is really effective in terms of my time. And it usually is it's it's quite easy, I find, for for the other person to understand. That's brilliant. So you actually... You delegate tasks and feedback through a video just on your webcam of you talking through. 
yeah, it's, what it, needs doing. It's not even actually a, a. It's not a webcam. It's not me talk. They, they just see the screen that I'm on. Yeah, so, a screencast. Yeah, yeah right, so yeah. so they get the audio. And normally, if it's web design, I will say, "Hey, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Rajesh, for working on this this page. Um, you know, the headline's not quite right, or I might inspect a bit of code and show them that something I want tweaked." Or if it's PowerPoint, you know, rather than writing paragraphs and paragraphs of text, which would take me longer, probably take them longer to interpret. Which we're all guilty of doing. Yeah, you know, it, that, it's yeah. more like, you know, this is what I'm thinking of the illustration that I would like you to create and how it needs to be animated um, and given direction that way. That's a great idea. I'm, I'm definitely going to steal that one. That's fantastic. So I use Snagit, which I'm not sure if it's just a Mac app. They may well have a Windows version, and then you can link it to Dropbox. So then once you've recorded the video, you just you know, the copy link, yeah. and then you just send them that link. So it's really quick and easy to do. Yeah, because I, I'm interested in communication because, um, you know, Slack has been so popular in recent years and um, has been a, touted as an email killer. But actually, I love email. And again, I mean, not that I'm some big fan of Elon Musk, but... Um, I was just reading about some of his productivity hacks recently. He loves email as well because of the fact it's asynchronous and you can batch it because we talk about batch work and doing shallow work. You know, Slack and Skype and things like that, they're interruptive, whereas email, you can respond to everybody in one go. It's a batch of work. It's very efficient. Um, and you can obviously just write I think, what you need and get it off and that's it. You're done. You can move on. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I haven't, you know, I've, I've used Slack. I know how to use it. It's not something I, you know, I tend for your kind of team communication, my team, my team are my, um, are my freelancers. And I tend to do that more through Trello and, um, yeah, online video, you know, online screencast. So I think it depends. It's not so much the medium. It's what works for you and your team. Um, and I think email is always going to be part of it. You know, it, it may be that there are other ways that you're, you're using, whether it's Slack or Trello. But, um, you know, it's that nice sort of evergreen way of communicating, isn't it? Everyone's got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's great. Thanks so much for that. That's really insightful. Now, there's a I think I'm right in saying there's a blog post in the membership section on the Digital Marketing Institute website and a toolkit for productivity that you've created. Um, and also just uh, tell listeners where they can find you online as well. Okay, yeah. So my name's Joe, Joe the SEO. Um, you can find me at tribeseo.com. Um, on LinkedIn, I think it's linkedin.com slash IN slash Joseph Williams. And at Twitter, it's, it's at Joe the SEO. Great. Well, thanks so much, Joe. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, really appreciate it. And thanks a lot for the opportunity, Well. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about developing your own soft skills in marketing, head to digitalmarketinginstitute.com. Thanks for listening.